So, um, can everybody hear me? Okay, everybody's good. So I'm a wanderer. I think I'll just leave this off. My, my voice uh, carries pretty well, and we'll see if I can uh, move this uh, slide. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to start with this slide. This is a nice series of little, uh, uh, the boy that drew these, he likes to draw uh, people with numbers, at least at this phase when he was drawing them. He used to do these all the time. He went on later, drew big maps of the United States for a long time. and. and uh, would do, the, do these free and I thought this is appropriate for our topic uh, uh, today. And uh, we have a, I, I'm confident we have a mixed crowd here of, of parents and, and uh, providers and students. Uh, maybe we can get a show of hands of uh, who is uh, here because they have a relative uh, with a developmental disability. So that looks like uh, maybe about half, but who is here uh, because they are in school or something, that's another group. Like, who's here because they just like to hear me talk? <laughs> so, I see some, some, some parents out here that, that I know. I appreciate you, appreciate you coming. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to talk uh, today about a, a topic uh, that is close to, close to my heart, which is uh, transitioning into adulthood. And uh, for individuals with autism spectrum disorders, and, and I think you can generalize this topic to individuals with other uh, developmental disabilities because I think that uh, uh, they are facing many of the same uh, obstacles that are are individuals that, that uh, have autism spectrum disorders are facing. And um, I uh, just a little background about about me. So it's Albany, not not uh, Alabama. Roll Tide, I was going to say. Um, so uh, I, I went to, I was in uh, medical school in Albany and I did my residency at UCLA and, and uh, was uh, lucky as an individual interested in behavioral neurology to uh, have exposure to autism in my residency training back in the early 1990s, which is rare because there were only a few centers that were doing uh, autism research and autism treatment at that time. You know, if you're familiar with the prevalence numbers uh, back in the 1980s, the prevalence of autism was what? One in 10,000. And our current numbers are one in 100. And uh, it was in the 1990s that really saw this really steep uh, rise in the prevalence numbers. And I was, uh, when I finished my residency, I went into private practice. I had a private practice up in, up in Edmonds. Uh, uh, I think a, a few of us were, were uh, seeing me up there, and, and uh, it, the, this is really even pre-internet, and, and uh, the parent group is very tight, uh, even back in those days, and uh, uh, became parents became aware that I had an interest in, in autism, and, and uh, I had there. I remember a couple of experiences back in my practice at, at that time that really uh, solidified uh, my love for this field, which was uh, a couple of experiences with, with some uh, kids that we would maybe call lower functioning uh, with autism that were nonverbal. And the experience, that, that the approach that I took with them, uh, I decided to approach them as if they understood what I was saying. And, and it's, it's, uh, it seems like a basic thing, but uh, a lot of physicians don't do that with autism. And, and, uh, a lot of individuals that you meet out in the community uh, treat them you know, like you might treat a foreigner that doesn't understand English and, and talk to them in a, in a way that's kind of stilted. And, and I decided, no, I'm going to talk to them as if they can understand me. And, and uh, I had some really interesting interactions with some kids that normally would not like being at the physician's office. And in this case, they came and sat on my lap, and my you know, parent would say, oh, they've never done this before. And, you know, it, it allowed me to really understand an, uh, an important concept that with some of the kids that have difficulty communicating that you can't really assume to understand what they understand. Uh, it, it's a, it's a uh, dangerous if you make those assumptions. And so it was really, um, that was really enticing to develop these relationships with these individuals that, that uh, seem to be locked in and unable to uh, really communicate what they really understood. Um, and then uh, it, we kind of, kind of continued into the 2000s, and the families were really struggling back then. They still were uh, really struggling at, at finding anybody that could
could diagnose or could, would provide services. And, and uh, what I kept hearing from parents was the desire to work with somebody that, uh, or some place that really they could ha help handle all of the questions that surround uh, this very fascinating uh, condition. And uh, what I was seeing is families were falling through the cracks of this kind of uh, game between the psychiatrists and neurologists and pediatricians and psychologists where no one was taking leadership. No one was really taking the ball. And the ball was left to the parent to really run the show. And uh, for a chronic illness, that's really not the model that we, we uh, develop with other chronic illnesses, yet autism was, was facing that. And so in uh, 2003, we formed uh, a nonprofit organization called ASTAR, which was down here in South Lake Union, and, and uh, many SPU students uh, rotated through there. And uh, we served over 1,500 families during a six-year time period that we were open. Uh, couldn't stay open for several reasons. One, because we run out of money every year before our, before our auction, which would barely give me enough money to stay open for a little while longer. And, uh, but thankfully, the timing was such that uh, leadership at University of Washington and Seattle Children's had already been planning to, to move forward with the autism center. And uh, I went to Brian King, who is chairman of psychiatry at Children's and is an autism guy, also trained at UCLA. Go Bruins. But, uh, um, no I'm going to the UW game. And I'm rooting, because you're Oregon, you're in real trouble. Um, so, uh, you know, we got together and we said, you know, we came to the community and we said, well, one of the reasons that a center like this doesn't exist is because it, it's at an expensive services to provide. Lots of hands-on services, a um, lot of lack of funding, and uh, uh, really, there's reasons why there aren't autism clinics on every block. And uh, so, but thankfully, with the partnership with, with uh, the community and the Seattle Children's and University of Washington, uh, the Seattle Children's Autism Center opened up in uh, the summer of 2009. Uh, we served uh, about 70 families the first month. We now serve about 1,500 families a month. And so we're slated to serve about 17,000 uh, this year. We still have a wait list of over 1,400, of which over 400 of those are undiagnosed. Uh, so we have still huge tasks in front of us. Now, there have been a lot of advances in, in this past decade with early intervention services, work done at the University of Washington Autism Center, which is one of the great research institutions for autism, um, work in other sites around the country, and. and uh, advocacy work to get uh, early intervention services covered by some insurances. A lot of providers from coming from places like this and from the University of Washington are now available. Um, however, families that in which their children are 18 and older um, face another frontier where there aren't these services. And so it's, it's, uh, it's like, really, again? I mean, we did it back in the 1990s when there were no services. Now we have to do it again as an adult. And, uh, but one of the reasons that I got into this is because I'm an adult neurologist by training. I'm not a pediatric neurologist. I went into autism because there was this need and I had an interest in it. So nobody cared. They let me do it. And I, I became uh, you know expert through my practice. Um, but now that I'm affiliated with Seattle Children's University of Washington, I'm happy to kind of transition into the transition group. And the other reason I'm happy is I get to follow uh, families that I've known for so many years, so it's uh, selfish on my part in, in many ways. Um, so that's, that's my, my background. Um, so when we, talk to, when we talk to families, you know, we, we have these certain questions that we face when an individual is diagnosed. Um, questions that families face about what is what does the future hold? Uh, what, are, what is my expectation? You know, it's kind of a diagnosis of autism in so many ways kind of wipes the slate clean. Uh, and humans don't do well when they don't know have a future in place and, and don't have a track. And so parents go through a lot of anxiety not understanding where is my child going? And, now the job, ultimately, for a parent is the same job. It's, it's the job of, of creating an environment for their child to flourish and be happy. But that environment is, can often be very different. 
and the job that they do, uh, the details of their job can be very different. And um, what we, when we think about adulthood, you know, we think, well, what, what is, what is my child going to do? How can I create an environment for my now adult child to be happy? What can I expect? And where do I go to find help? You know, for to address these questions that I don't know how to answer. Um, so, that, so this is we're going to talk about some of these some of these issues, and, and I want to highlight a case uh, just to give us kind of a framework. And this is a. Uh, this is Carl. Carl has uh, given me per Carl and Carl's parents have given me permission to use his information. And we're going to hopefully see some videos here. That works. Carl had a fairly typical presentation for autism in that the what what I would call the idiopathic form of autism, where there was really no trauma at birth, no motor delay during the first year, uh, and then like about one third of kids that present with autism present with what we call a regressive form where they have been developing, some of them a little slow, but then they dip and they decline in their function. They lose words, they lose eye contact, uh, they start developing uh, odd and atypical behaviors. Now that's about a third, about two thirds of the kids just don't develop at the proper rate with regards to their length, their communication, and their social abilities. And we talk about these three core domains. We talk about the language, we talk about the social, and in Carl's case, you know, playing alone, uh, the third part is this The third part, which is critical, is the repetitive behaviors and restricted interests, which in his case he was demonstrating some repetitive motor mannerisms, including hand flapping and running in a particular pattern that he would go all over the same place in his house. Um, he had some additional associated uh, symptoms. Uh, he had a, some interesting family history, and then he went. He got diagnosed with. Uh, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. Uh, you psychology students, you're familiar with these categories. <laughs> DSM-4. Uh, we're going to soon be seeing DSM-5 come out, and uh, there's going to be, looks like a change in that currently the DSM-4 has the three major categories, has autism, Asperger's, and PDD-NOS. In DSM-5, it looks like that's going to get White, whitewashed into autism spectrum disorder. And the term PDD, pervasive developmental disorder, is going to go away because we hardly use it anymore anyway. We call it autism spectrum disorder. And the, the, uh, the qualifiers are going to be, again, this is prediction, the qualifiers are going to be with or without intellectual disability and with or without an underlying neurological or genetic syndrome. Uh, those are the two factors that we know influence prognosis. Um, the, now, there's going to be some card-carrying Asperger's members that are going to be upset by this. <laughs> and we'll probably allow them to continue to be called Asperger's, get grandfathered in, so to speak. Um, but, uh, and the reason that, you know, we thought we knew at DSM-4 in the early 1990s, you know, differentiating Asperger's from autism, but there's a group that comes from autism and PDD-NOS that have normal intellectual abilities, have normal IQ, which is a, in, required for the Asperger's to have normal IQ, but there's this group from autism and PDD-NOS that have normal IQ, that if you look at that kid and the Asperger's kid, let's say at age 12, and you put your blinders on and you don't take the history of their language development, their delay, they look often very much the same. And, and so it hasn't helped us as much as we thought it might in predicting prognosis and what their needs are. What has been found though is the, the issue of do they have mental retardation, i.e. Uh, intellectual disability in addition to the autism. And do they have a, a form of syndromic autism? We're using that term for individuals that have a, a known syndrome with autism, a, an associated behavioral a diagnosis associated with their syndrome. So for instance, Down syndrome, where you get a lot of kids with Down syndrome that have social interests, social desires, uh, and then you get, and don't have repetitive behaviors, and then you get this other group that meet criteria for, for autism. Um, in the old day, the developmental pediatricians used to call, call that Down syndrome with autistic features. And oh, they can't have autism because they have Down. It's like, well, no, we look at DSM-4, Downs is not an exclusion. You can have both. Autism is a behavioral diagnosis. 
It does not imply the underlying cause. So we're using syndromic autism for that group. Uh, if you look at this idiopathic group, uh, this is a group that's heavily weighted to boys versus girls, about four to one, five to one, even if you look at some studies, boys and girls. If you look at the syndromic group, these, these fragile X and downs and that, it's one to one, boys and girls. So if you have a girl with autism and the girl had motor delay and the girl had seizures or things like that, you have to be thinking they've got some other underlying syndrome. Um, if you have a girl that doesn't have all these things, if you have a girl that had normal motor development and such, that girl is very likely to be very high functioning. Um, so, and, and the reason being is that it seems that girls have a stronger social desire. They might be clumsy, their, their social IQ is not that great, but they have a strong, stronger social desire often than often more than the boys. So, um, so uh, Carl, uh, when we saw him in the exam room, uh, he didn't have any physical dysmorphic features. He had a normal neurological exam. Did some did some behaviors that we can observe in the, in the clinic, such as decreased joint attention. And when we show an object of interest, uh, the child that is neurotypical looks at the object and then makes a triangle between the object and, and the examiner and themselves. They, oh, that's interesting, look up. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Are you smiling? You're smiling, okay, I like this. Um, the child with autism just stares at the object and does not make that triangle, does not make that connection. Um, autistic leading is a term we'll use sometimes, a, a way when we ask, how does a child get their needs met if they don't have words? Well, they come and grab my hand and they lead me and they put my hand on the object almost use their parent as an object uh, to get their needs met. Um, it's not always easy to pick up on autism behaviors in the clinic or in the office. Uh, a lot of we rely so much on the parent report you know, for the diagnostic process. Uh, Carl was at the EEU. Uh, if you've been over to the Experimental Educational Unit, a great place. And uh, now, now Carl, uh, you know, so when you made a diagnosis of pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, which we think, well, that's milder autism maybe than, than the formal autistic disorder. Uh, of course, uh, we look at centers throughout the United States and we look at the consistency, that's another reason to wipe the slate clean. If we look at consistency of the major universities and major research centers with labeling autism versus PDD-NOS, uh, you'll get some centers that 100% of the kids coming out of the center get labeled with autistic disorder. We get another center where 65% come out labeled PDD-NOS. So there's not consistency from site to site on those differences. So when I see this diagnosis, I'm like, well, I don't know. It's autism spectrum disorder is what it is. Um, but some of the early things, he, he did start to communicate. He started with early intervention services. He started to use words and started to uh, um, use some fragmented sentences. You could get a conversation with him if you talked about Disney characters or Disney movies, then you know, he, would, he would talk to you about that. Um, Remain started to develop social interests, but was still awkward. So, so this is at age six in the kindergarten. He was uh, being partially mainstreamed. Uh, what's this kid going to look like as an adult? Are they going to be, are they going to lose the diagnosis? Is a kid like this going to no. you know, be one of you in the room here? Uh, is this kid going to require 24-7 services? Or is it going to be somewhere in between? Um, so, um, so that's Carl. So, so what, what do you think of Carl? Nice guy. Um, any observations? Uh, I mean, what, would you, what would you say about some of his... Uh, speech mannerisms or behaviors, and do they want to throw anything out there? So, so um, one of the things that we see with Carl's speech is Carl uh, embeds little phrases, little things that uh, are not quite natural for the setting. Uh, the tone in his voice is probably a little stilted. And, uh, 
definitely get a question about how much Carl is understanding. You know, he, he does well with very directed questions, questions that he's practiced, you know, when's your birthday? You know, Dad you know, knew how to get answers out of him better than I did. I would tend to ask these open-ended questions and you can see him kind of struggle uh, with those. Um, the video doesn't highlight as well as it could some of his anxiety that he has. Uh, he has a variety of mannerisms that uh, to me, clearly represent. He does a lot of tapping, and um, he gets more. He got more comfortable as he was going along here. If I if I would continue the video, he, he ends up singing a song for us. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, Carl is doing some work at the food bank. Uh, this is sheltered work, so he's not doing this totally independently. Uh, Carl lives at home. Uh, and Carl has some medical conditions. Carl had developed seizures in, uh, as a teenager. And uh, Carl did have a period of time that he actually became very, developed some very vivid uh, aspects of his imagination to the point where it actually looked like it was hallucinations. And uh, he is on several behavioral medications which, which are helping to reduce his anxiety and really help his thought processing. Um, so, it's, uh, you know, where does this land on the outcome trajectory? And uh, uh, let me just show one other case, uh, just real briefly, and then we'll, we'll go into some discussion on it. So, uh, so Dana probably could be someday in this class. You can just sense Dana's higher functioning uh, than Carl. Um, some aspects about his language. Um, Comments from anybody? Come on, come on, guys. I know you're thinking of something. Yeah. Well, there wasn't a whole lot of context because it was vague. He would say some things, sort of. Yeah. He put some fillers in, all the, and, and his fillers seemed more appropriate. Mm -hmm. It seemed uh, the context of his fillers uh, were pretty appropriate for an 18 year old. You know, you see his gestures and mannerisms, again, more appropriate. This dress, you know, he's got the black jacket black on. Jacket. <laughs> Uh, now I don't show I, I don't show Dana from years before. Um, I'm still talking to mom, and we're trying to get that video because I think that would be uh, nice to see as well. Uh, not a huge difference in Dana from Carl in those in that age two to five. Okay, and in fact uh, Dana at age uh, twelve he. <laughs> He started to, uh, when I kind of first met him, he was just becoming aware of his autism. And he would come in and say, hi, I'm Dana, I have autism. <laughs> and uh, he was uh, Mr. Contrarian. He would disagree with everything he said or everything that mom said. So, so I'd say, how's your mom? I don't have a mom. <laughs> I don't go to school. And so one, one time uh, we were calling to talk to his mom to confirm an appointment, and Dana answered the phone. Again, it's like 12, and it's like, Oh, is this Dana? No, it's not. Uh, yes. And then you want to say the correct answer after that. Uh, can we talk to your mom? She's not here. I don't have a mom. And it's like, so Dana developed self awareness of, of his autism. And we, we use this term theory of mind. Uh, so, Hopefully some of you have heard that term before. It's a term to, to, to describe a developmental stage where uh, humans recognize that they are unique and that, and that others are like them, yet different entities. And uh, typically humans develop this, you know, age three, four, or five. And in autism spectrum disorders, it's significantly delayed. And sometimes we don't even know if it ever comes in for some individuals. You know, you can see Carl, and you can see how aware is he. Uh, he's aware of his differences to a certain degree, probably. You can see Dana. Uh, you can imagine that he is more aware, and actually that awareness emerged earlier. When I meet an adult, especially an adult with high-functioning autism that I'm talking with, it's a great question to ask. I suggest that you think about asking this, is asking the question of, when did you realize you were different? from other kids your age. Um, you have to be a little delicate with it, uh, with, the, with the question of the timing of when they ask it with the individual. Um, you'll be, I think you'll be impressed and surprised by how, how they remember that. 
I mean, to the to the second grade, and they can tell the experience. And the younger that is, what it appears to me correlates with the higher functioning individuals, the individuals that are, are saying kindergarten or first grade compared to the individual that says sixth grade or seventh grade. Um, so we, I like to I like to ask that because it kind of helps me, but. Also, when we're, when we're seeing individuals, when we're with them through their childhood and we're trying to project, predict this trajectory, um, when the kid starts to become, asking questions about themselves, and why did this kid do this to me? You know, these are difficult times for parents, but really good sign. And I think it's, it's good to be able to point that out to the parent when they're trying to hold the ship together and say, no, this is really good. You know, all the anxiety that your child's going through. Um, so, so we're very interested in this topic of, of developmental trajectory. And there's very little in the literature about this. Um, there are several studies that are ongoing that are prospective longitudinal studies. Uh, Kathy Lord's group, University of uh, um, Michigan, uh, who developed the ADOS testing and the ADI have been following a large cohort forward. And uh, several other studies that have gone and looked at this. And the way, uh, the number I'm using with parents is, is uh, there's about 20% that have this nice, really nice trajectory, uh, kind of like Dana, where, where you see um, this potential really of employment, of university, of marriage, and, and all of this. Uh, when you when you look at them at age 18, they really and you test them with module four of the ADOS, they really don't meet criteria based on the core symptoms of autism. There's another 20% that don't have that good outcome, that continue to be severely and profoundly impacted by their core deficits in autism, and are most likely going to require continuing support through, through all aspects of their life. And then there's this, the majority that are in the middle that make good progress relative to where they were before, but are still behind uh, their peers and still have features about their autism. And that, that's the group that's a little more difficult to quantify in my experience. And I think you can know this, I think you can start to recognize this trajectory um, by the time they're age 10 to 12. I think you really can start to feel confident that you're recognizing where, where they're kind of landing on this trajectory. Um, something that we've seen and that we concern us, that, that the literature has supported and makes me very concerned, is this group that uh, has worsening of autism symptoms when they become adults. And this is something that we need to understand like, why this is. Is this because they're bored, because they're no longer going to school? Is there a degenerative process going on in the brain that is superimposed upon their neurodevelopmental process? There is some basic science studies and literature that is starting to suggest that possibility. And this is, needs a lot more research to understand this. Um, something that I've been impressed with is uh, this is a schematic, so this is just something that I put together. You know, when you think about the typical neurodevelopmental pattern of a, of a human brain, uh, it's very accelerated through the school years and it starts to plateau into its adult state by age 18. Uh, and from there, from then on, it's downhill. <laughs> so so uh, if you look at the natural aging of the brain, uh, yes, we do become more mature and learned, and but our processing speed and our memory and things like that start to decline. But it really reaches that adult state by age 18. Um, we might propose a different trajectory. There maybe there is a different trajectory with with autism spectrum and other neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, I'm very impressed by meeting the 28 year old and going back and looking at what they were like when they were 18. <clears throat> and what a difference I see in that. And that is a huge message, I think, and a very important message for a number of reasons. I think um, when, you know, this is again kind of the, the painting the picture for the parent. Uh, when you bought into this, when you had kids, you kind of had this uh, picture that you're kind of done at age 18. You know you're not. I mean, yeah, you know, but those of you that have adult kids, you realize you're never done. But you know, you kind of have launched them out of the nest. 
know, they go off to college and you still support them with their launch. It's a different trajectory for these guys. You have to prepare for that. You're in a different race than you thought you were. It's, it's longer. Okay. But, at the same time, you make progress. It's not static. It's not like, I lost at age 18. It's not like the race is over. So that the, so those two things about understanding the longevity and preparing that you got to be you know, have enough Gatorade for the for the trip, uh, but understanding that you're going to continue to make progress after that age 18. So really, two critical points I think when you're counseling parents when they're in the midst and they're just really struggling maybe in the teen years. Yes. I think you can inspire the challenges. Yes, I think that I think that this is I, I, the, I'm, I'm seeing this in all three of those trajectories, the high, the low, the medium. I'm seeing this progress into the 20s. You know, so um, one of my favorite stories, uh, a 28-year-old that uh, is almost nonverbal, who uh, in his mid-20s finally started to develop uh, an understanding of his own self and, and future started to work on things more. He'd been worked through school and DVR, and then and he had some great basic skills that that uh, the job world saw and was like, oh, there's potential for this guy if we can, if you know, if he can actually initiate. He started to initiate more and started to have a desire to do these things. Ended up getting a job with one of the county agencies. Uh, it was a very specific job to go and do his job. The uh, job was successful, 40, 40 hours a week, uh, you know, got uh, medical insurance, you know, the whole, the whole thing. Great, right? And so he's still living at home, you know, and eventually, and again, very few words, and he um, tells his mom, uh, I don't want to live here anymore. Um, mom had trouble with that. There's <laughs> moms out there, you can understand. So, uh, so okay, after like a year or two, they, he moves into an apartment, and uh, mom calls him every day after work, make sure he got home, right? Three o'clock, you know. One day, he doesn't answer. And, oh, she goes into a panic. Calls 911, calls the cops. <laughs> they go over to this place. Where is he? He's not there. They're searching. They find this flyer for the ice rink. They're like, oh, I don't know. He likes skating. They go to the ice rink. He was at the ice rink, he was rented skates, he was skating. So, it, it, I, it, it's just a story about, for me, how much is on our side as parents, you know, like, what do we, you know, how do we know when to let go, how do we know when to support, it's, it's an ongoing thing, just like you do with your younger kids and with your teenagers, you have to continue that support. But at the same time, allowing them to grow. You know, so it's it's a uh, it's tiring. <laughs> so what are some of the obstacles that we're facing? Uh, Josh Perkins here, he goes to the uh, he is a student at the Art Institute, and he draws freehand just out of his imagination. Pretty amazing. So he's uh, he's looking to become a cartoonist. Not like like the work. So. so we've got lots of different things that, that you face. And we're just going to kind of march through some of these some of these issues uh, for adults. Um, so I talked about this already about, about these kind of three different trajectories. And you can imagine, so I find this very important in the teen years, and we're doing this now at Seattle Children's, especially in the kind of age 16 to 18, to identify which trajectory are, are we on. Because you can imagine with each trajectory, each one of those issues, housing, education, vocation, medical, are different. And I think that's really important. And I think you can establish that and kind of understand that and help yourself and start to be more specific as you move into that transition into adulthood. Um, this is a kind of a famous study by Gans uh, who looked at costs. The majority of services, if you think about it, it's like, yeah, they're going to be adults for a long time. Um, life expectancy, as far as we know, is, is normal. Uh, most of the costs of uh, this population are as adults. Um, we really see lots of obstacles. You know, school ends at age 21. You know, if I had, if I had one thing I could do, uh, 
with Obama, I'd say, extended to age 24 for individuals with developmental disabilities. I, I, could do a lot, I think I could do a lot more out of this extra few years. It feels like just when we're starting to get traction, it comes down. And I think we've got a lot of work to do with the community colleges and with universities like this to how can we support these individuals and continue their, continue their educational process. Um, the state, uh, we absolutely cannot depend upon the state to help support our adults. We have to depend upon the community. There are some lucky ones that have what are called waivers, which uh, allow for uh, ongoing services uh, into adulthood. And, uh, but they are basically not giving any new waivers for individuals with autism. Uh, you basically have to have somebody that either move out of the state or die for a waiver to come up, and then they assign it based on a list, and there's over seven to 10,000 individuals waiting for those services. And it's just gonna continue to grow as, as this baby boomer population continues to age. Um, Department of Vocational Rehabilitation uh, will help you. Uh, we do like the concept of tax payments rather than tax burdens. So the state has continued to fund DVR, uh, but you have to be able to prove a path for employment. So this uh, only uh, hits a certain number of our uh, adults. Um, individuals that require more services, uh, you can't do this forever on your own. You're not even gonna be around forever as a parent. So we have these uh, uh, companies that have higher in-home care providers that get paid for by the state. Uh, these in-home care providers go through training to become cert certified, registered, and have uh, a license. Things like wound care and, and bathing, and, and, but autism behaviors, no. There's no training track for those individuals. And so we're really struggling with educating the in-home care providers about autism. Uh, a lot of in-home care providers are uh, uh, immigrants. Uh, many of them, English is a second language. Their concept of mental health issues uh, is quite alarming. Um, and, and I think we have a lot of work to do to educate this group. Um, we talked about you know, kind of parents, you know, the parenting the 25-year-old um, Especially if more high functioning, are you still their parent? When are you their peer? Um, you know, is, is codependency and the difficulties go both ways. You'll see the parents, you know, continuing to do too much. You'll see the kids continue to let their parents do too much, and uh, so that that is very difficult. And that's where I think we can really use the help of the mental health therapist and the psychologist. Uh, with a role that is a little different than the classic kind of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that you might, that you might think of. Um, so several of the things that we work on, again, at that age 16 to 18, uh, if you don't know Will Kerner's art, I'd suggest you go to Will's um, website, Will's paper cutouts. Will is uh, almost nonverbal and he cuts out these shapes and puts them on, on the table and they form these beautiful images. And then he misses, messes them all up, but his grandmother comes yeah. and takes a picture of them uh, before he messes it up. And then she takes the pieces and puts them back together. And uh, he, they have, his art is down at a gallery down near, uh, near the uh, stadiums uh, called Art with the Heart. And he just sold his first original. Uh, 14,000. Yeah, so and he's only 16 at this point, so he may have a career. Um, so we look at things like guardianship and power of attorney for this, for this group. And uh, these are issues that, you, you know, the other thing I see parents do, they don't want to talk about this. It's like, I think a couple reasons. It's like, you, this is like admitting you have to, you're still in the game. The game's not over. It's like, we're going to have to do right. You have to do this. I don't want to talk about it right now. Well, you need to start thinking about it and talking about it by the age 16 to 18. Because some of these things, there's kind of a, some deadlines a little bit. Um, if you have a, an individual that needs decision making for their personal care and their medical health, and they turn 18 and you have an established guardianship, uh, what if they go out and do something silly and get arrested? You as a parent don't have rights 
to advocate for them. That's a really big deal. Um, what about the higher functioning individual that uh, uh, starts to do some things online like uh, buy a bunch of stuff or get taken advantage of? And we have some horrible stories about individuals, not just the lower functioning, but higher functioning individuals getting taken advantage of. And these, these things such as power of attorney, uh, they, they're not, abs you can really designate specific things. And power of attorney, the individual has participation and can end it at any time. So you have the 18-year-old high-functioning with Asperger's. Um, you really, that individual, it may be in their best interest to have their parent have some degree of power of attorney. Um, and it is giving up some rights, but they are temporary in their agreements. Uh, the guardianship has to go in, actually in front of the court. That's a bigger deal. Um, but, but you really need to start thinking and looking at those things. Uh, Social Security, when you turn age 18, you're now an adult, and if you can't uh, support yourself with employment, you meet criteria for Social Security, for SSI. Um, so that's important to be aware of that. DDD, we talked about the Division of Developmental Disabilities, these waivers, and they're not providing a lot of support. But I would strongly recommend you still fill out the paperwork before they turn age 18. I, I had a 28-year-old that I'm working with who um, Mom never did it. Uh, you know, I'm not. I, I hear there's no money coming from the state anyway, and you know, my my husband, the physician, is always gonna, you know, is, makes enough money. Well, she didn't plan for the husband and her to get divorced, and the husband will, um, no longer support the adult, and so she's left holding the bag, and he doesn't have any ability to go and even get DVR, you know, until they go back, and it's a big, big hassle, big process. So these things you really want to do and plan for this before before turning age 18. And I, um, on this slide, um, I have a couple of sites. I I still learn this stuff. It's very complicated. Um, you know, so I, I put a couple of websites. Our, our, we have a blog at the, at Seattle Children's now, and uh, so we are talking about some of these issues. So you, that could be a resource. But, Arc of King County is a great uh, resource for looking into the details about things such as guardianship and these things we're talking about. So, um, a large percentage of individuals with, with uh, autism continue to live with their parents. Uh, is that in their best interest? Yes? No? Depends. What, what does it depend on? Well, which category they're in. Yeah, so I think how much support they need, right? Um, I think that uh, what we're seeing is we are definitely seeing, you know, individuals continue to live with their parents into their 20s. Most of these developmental trajectory levels run through their 20s. Um, the, one, the one study that was published um, asked the moms, uh, they divided them between moms that had their child placed in some sort of residential facility, an adult family home or something, versus moms where the adult was still living at home. And uh, the moms that, uh, that where their child was placed felt the care was better, felt that the, the adult child was happier, but they felt guilty. Uh, the moms that still had their child at home didn't have as much guilt, but didn't feel that their child was receiving as good a care. Um, so, so you have to make sure you understand why are you making the decision, you know, because there's a lot of pressure uh, and a lot of guilt that can go in with placing your adult child into a, a care facility. Yet, I've, there's so many cases where I've seen them and I see them come back a year later and smiles on everybody's faces and the parents saying, boy, you know, this is a really hard decision, but they're so, they're so much happier. Got these individuals that go out and they go for walks and they go to the store and they go. And I was so exhausted I couldn't do that after school ended. They were just at home, sitting playing video games or doing whatever they were doing, and getting more depressed and, and obese and all the other things that can happen with inactivity. So um, now that's not. I, I, and don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating a place you You know, I mean that. I think you just really need to ask the question about about whose interest you're looking after in that. And remember, you're their guardian, you're supposed to make decisions on their behalf, um, you know, from their point of view. So, 
And again, for some of the individuals that have difficulty communicating, if only you would just tell me what you want, you know, it's so hard sometimes. But a lot of times I think you can feel it and know what they want and need. Um, but sometimes it's getting over your own fears you know, about those sort of situations. I think that if we were a different society, uh, I think the United States is not set up well uh, for our adults with, with autism. I think the societies that have these larger family units, um, you know, I have this one adult that moved uh, from Africa and uh, was in a tribe basically, and in Africa, uh, he folded and mended socks and was a member of the family and had his role. And here in the States, he didn't have anything in a small family unit that could not support him. You know, so it's really important that we as a community set up or, or step up because our small our small family units cannot do it by themselves. Um, so a low percentage of individuals seem to go on to, to school. And this 12% is you know half of that 20% that we talked about, that kind of high functioning uh, group. Uh, this is data out of the UK, which has collected better data than we have collected in the US. What has been shown, though, if you set up the proper support, individuals, a lot of individuals can maintain themselves in a the job. Um, we have not done this. This is this program that, that Hallam set up in the UK um, is a support system in which a lot of work goes into educating the employer and the co-workers as opposed to all of the work going into the skill of the individual, which is what we do here in the United States with PDR. We, the Department of Hope Rehab focuses heavily on the skill of the individual. And then once they're placed, it's like, okay, good luck. And uh, um, there's so much about educating the coworker and, and educating the people around them in the club to understand what are the accommodations that are needed. We're doing better with this at school, right? Uh, we do a really good job now with younger kids. We're doing better with older kids in school, and we're still failing with our adults in the, in the, in the, in the job placement. Uh, the successful cases that I've seen anecdotally have managers that have a kid with autism, or a sibling with autism, yeah. or some other developmental disability. And they have an understanding and recognition that when he doesn't look at me when I talk to him, doesn't mean that he's being rude. Mm -hmm. He has autism. You know, so, um, so this is, we've got a lot of work to do with our employers. Uh, so we'll talk about mental health and medical health a little bit. Um, psychi psychiatric comorbidities are, are very prominent. We talked about anxiety uh, is even more prevalent in the higher functioning group, probably partly because of the self-awareness, probably partly because we demand more from them and the, the amount of support that they receive is sometimes lacking. Um, we have seen the need for psychotropic medications. Uh, this number about do they stay on the meds, do, does the development of the brain allow you to eventually come off of these medications, and the medications are just a bridge. I think we see that in some cases. However, when I talk to a parent now, I say, if this is a decision, you kind of go into it, you know, this may be a lifelong decision on medications. You need to prepare for that possibility, because it does appear that a large percentage of kids do need the medications in adulthood. And this is high functioning, low functioning, uh, across the game. Um, very little recreational opportunities for this population. For this population, one of the things that I emphasize to parents is just because it worked for a while, they like what they're doing. Uh, you know, interests change. You know, sometimes you get, you actually do have to change. If you have an individual that uh, cannot communicate well, they they can't communicate that well to you. You have to just anticipate that their that their needs and desires are going to change. Now it's true. They have hyper-focused interests, and some of them stay stuck on a topic you know, their entire life. Um, but very often they change. I had an 18-year-old that uh, mom brought in, and uh, he had been doing really, had behavioral problems really bad for a while, but got settled down, behavior got better. All of a sudden, age 18, his behavior started getting worse. Uh, he's pretty nonverbal. Um, 
This was right at the time where mom was bringing in a caregiver and his brother was going off to college and his sister was doing these other things. And, and so she started thinking, maybe, well, maybe he just wants to do stuff. I don't know. So, so she took him for drives into Seattle and he loved it. He loved going for drives into Seattle and just kind of looking around. So we were talking about him in front of him. She was telling these stories and he did not like us talking about it. He was covering his ears and he was very upset. And, uh, so I took, a, I took a stab at it. I go, you know, I think he just wants to go clubbing. <laughs> he just wants to go hang out. And all of a sudden, a smile. <laughs> and he came up to me, and, yeah. and sure enough, yeah, he just wanted, he had new interests, but he has difficulty communicating those new interests. Um, what we really need, I think, for a lot of these individuals are something that we're seeing develop in the high schools and middle schools are these peer mentors. And if, I, if we could get a way that we can get these in-home care providers to maybe go hang out at the club with the individuals, <laughs> that way. Um, but I think we have to think about, you know, as those interests change. And yes, sometimes those interests do become more mature. Um, I have a, another 18-year-old that's uh, uh, planning to go into film school. Uh, he, his desire is to become uh, a video pornography filmer. <laughs> his parents were not real happy about that. <laughs> uh, so we're struggling with that one. Uh, you know, uh, what to do with that. So uh, uh, let me touch a little bit on medical health. So I mentioned Carl had the epilepsy. There is a fairly high frequency of, of seizures and epilepsy in this population. The more severely impacted, the, the higher the risk. Um, we think about 20%, uh, again, with regards to the risk of developing epilepsy. We see a lot of sleep disorders. Um, the main thing I'm trying to teach my pediatrician colleagues and, and family practice colleagues is having autism does not protect you from developing other medical conditions. <laughs> you can have GI problems. You can have sleep apnea. You can have these other these other things. So don't blame everything on the autism. Uh, especially if you see an individual that has been doing pretty well, and then all of a sudden behaviors become worse. Autism, like other neurological conditions, if you get a medical illness, it often manifests by worsening of the neurological symptoms. So a patient with multiple sclerosis gets a urinary tract infection, and their numbness on half their body increases. Okay, well the bacteria is not causing the numbness, it's just their threshold drops and their neurological symptom increases. Autism often does the same thing. Uh, you get some, you know, all of a sudden insomnia for whatever reason because you've got anxiety or whatever, and your autism symptoms can increase. But you have to think about the medical conditions as well as a potential stress in the body, especially in the population that can't communicate with autism. I love this one. This is a party play. I, I will. So, what does the future hold? Um, hopefully, better than what we what we have going on right now. If we look at the uh, autism spectrum disorder research funding by topic, uh, we see lots of money, lot a lot more than ten years ago into autism, but we see this tiny little sliver here for. Uh, funding for uh, research in adults, so less than 1%. So this has now been declared as a real uh, issue, uh, thankfully, that the NIH is, is really looking for projects that have to do with adults with autism. So, you know, for those of you that are looking for funding out there uh, and have an interest in this, uh, there are certainly a lot of calls for projects having, having to do with adults with autism, yes. I had a question about the mental health piece. Yes. Um, especially differentiating between some autistic symptoms and psychotic disorders. So yeah. I've seen a couple of clients now that I'm um, diagnosed with schizophrenia, and now hearing you talk, I'm wondering if maybe yeah. there are some other things going on. Yeah, so so the, the issue of is schizophrenia at a higher are you at a higher in, at, at an increased risk of developing schizophrenia if you have autism right. has not been well studied. If you look at the studies coming from the uh, adult psychiatry world, they don't do a good job of taking developmental histories, and and so I don't know if I rely on that. Uh, Nobody's done a really good prospective study of this. Right. Um, I, I definitely have individual anecdotal cases of individuals becoming psychotic. Okay. Um, 
And again, maybe the best thing, the safest thing is just to say again, autism does not protect you from becoming. So, so at minimum, yes, you can develop schizophrenia, you can uh, develop psychosis, and you may, and they may be at increased risk um, than, as compared to the average population. Uh, and those individuals are clearly individuals that um, you know you need to counsel, but we need to think about psychiatry being involved in, in, right. in those individuals. And I. Uh, a couple of cases I've often seen that age where you can see psychotic features. That 18 to 20 year old group mm -hmm. goes off the high functioning, you know, the beautiful mind goes off to college and gets super into their topic of interest and stops sleeping. And what's the perfect little trigger to yeah. cause psychosis is, is lack of sleep. So, um, so we definitely have seen seen cases like that. We've seen, I've seen cases of Severe autistic regression uh, in individuals that are older due to a psychological stressor, uh, psychological trauma that triggers a severe regression and has a flavor of psychosis to it that has required uh, psychiatric, you know, pretty intense psychiatric med management to kind of pull them out of it. Yeah. How much time are we going here? Should no. we end? Whenever, and we have to go until nine o'clock. Oh, we do. Time for questions. Okay, so I have a few other, just a few other case vignettes, and then we'll, we'll open up to questions. Okay. Um, uh, so, you know, talking about the future, I kind of touched on these things about the importance of uh, some of the things that we need to work on uh, with our community. Um, this is a case, just as an example of, you know, some su a success you know, relative success uh, in this case. A 25-year-old that I, that I see at age 19 had um, developed, really, doctors had stacked about five different behavioral meds on top on this child. Um, I've done that too, and I think sometimes I look at it and I say, I need to get a new look, because maybe, I don't know, I'm lost now. Are these meds causing problems? Are they giving benefit? Um, he ended up getting admitted to a hospital because of physical symptoms. He turned out he had a raging sinus infection uh, that we missed. And, and then because he was admitted, he kind of got scanned. And, oh my gosh, he's got horrible sinus. Put him antibiotics, improved. While in the hospital, they decided, you know, let's just take him off all of his psych meds. And uh, did that in a controlled fashion, and he was much better. Now, Subsequent to that, he has definitely required psych meds. And he, now we have him on, uh, I think, three psych meds, but at lower doses. But more importantly, this was also at a time where things had just fallen apart in the family. Um, you know, dad was sleeping on the couch, mom wasn't sleeping. You know, the other kids were so pissed because all the focus was on him. It was just a big nightmare in the family. And really, the hospitalization allowed for him to get kind of ground zero and start over. Um, and it also uh, bought him this, uh, this waiver because he was so severe. And thankfully, this waiver then allowed for the family to bring in funding to provide the necessary support to help the structure of the family. Um, the parents decided to invest in a second home that he moved into with these caregivers. Um, he had regular psychology involvement. He had then regular medication management. The caregivers could actually take him for walks that the parents weren't able to do. So he started, he lost, ended up uh, losing 20 pounds with appropriate exercise. Um, the behavioral strategies were supervised by a clinical psychologist familiar with autism. They were very structured. Uh, he is now working 20 hours a week in volunteer jobs at Seattle Children's and at University of Washington and at the EU. And uh, um, comes in and tells me about his YouTube videos and movies and DVDs. And, and he's, a, he's a crack up and he's happy. He's happy and, and the parents also have smiles on their faces. So, you know, to totally needs services. He's not a taxpayer, you know, but he's doing volunteer work and he's proud of the volunteer work. And, and to me, I see this as a, as a great success. And, you know, that's always important. You know, what is success? How do we measure success? You know, we can't measure it based on comparisons to others. We have to measure it on comparison to ourselves and what our capability is. 
And then one other case, 30-year-old um, female uh, diagnosed with Asperger's. So this is a girl coming from that high-functioning idiopathic group that we expect a lot out of. Um, hit you know some real major rocky uh, mental health issues in her early 20s. Uh, was really starting to show strong interest in boys, delayed kind of onset, didn't have that as a teenager, all of a sudden starts strong interest in boys, failing relationships because her social skills were still not the greatest. Um, really stressing, uh, really stressful for the family, still lived at home. Uh, started getting more obsessive compulsive symptoms superimposed upon her anxiety and depression. Um, and this critical first step for her about this buy-in um, is something that you kind of just, I don't think necessarily that you can force it. I think that it's again kind of related to their developmental stage. And sometimes we're sitting around waiting, you know, come on, let's go, I need you to participate you know, you can't just sit at home and play video games, you know, and, and so she finally recognized, oh, I got I, I am a member of this treatment team. I have to work on some of these things. You know, and with that, you know, she just, she kind of, oh, well, I, I have this injury, I'm going to go to a vocational school. She became a, um, she started exercising, she started going to counseling, she got a companion pet, uh, she was always very interested in animals. Uh, she went on medication, she took the medication that was appropriate for her, and uh, currently uh, she is, she did, uh, re she does receive social security insurance, she cannot work a full 40 hours a week, but she receives some of the money and has a, a part-time job. Uh, she's a pharmacy tech, she moved into her own place with her cat, she's got a boyfriend, actually longer than 12 months now. Um, lost about 20 to 30 pounds and is smiling and, and is happy. Um, the relationship with mom uh, has become so much more appropriate. Uh, they used to come in and mom would you know, be angry and, and frustrated and uh, then that transition to mom coming in with a smile to a transition to mom didn't come in. <laughs> Just she came in. And most recently, she and her boyfriend came. Wow. So, really nice. Um, you know, so there. Are, so again, that is to me that is success. You know, it's relative to kind of where she was, where she was at before. So just kind of highlighting the points that we were talking about before. Um, so, so then, this is actually uh, Peter. Uh, this is me. Actually, my, my bowl. I didn't like the other version. My the other version we did. My nose was just way too big. <laughs> Although my ear is kind of big, but that's. Okay. Uh, he ripped this out in like ten seconds. This is also my Facebook. <laughs> but I don't put out my Facebook to everybody. Sorry, just uh, just like that. So. <laughs> So thank you for your time. I'll, we'll open it up to any questions that you might have at this point. Yes? Um, I just want to support what you said about the, um, the improvements that you can see in your 20s. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence to support that. Um, the caveat I would add is that you need to continue to work with them because I've also seen them at 18, you're out of school, and the parents retire, and they just say, you're on your own. You're sitting at home playing video games, and you start seeing the mental illness manifest itself, and sometimes it's very hard to pull them out of that. So that would be my uh, caveat. And the other thing is that we always hear about early intervention, but I try to tell people we also have another window of opportunity at that age, and it's unfortunate that that's when the school entitlement ends. And for a lot of our kids, they are not you know, getting state services, there really isn't anything. So. Right. Yeah, I think that those early 20s are a really critical time for this population, and a lot of, especially the, the higher functioning group that, uh, I have an 18-year-old that um, hated school, um, really smart, but all he cared about was video games, and, uh, all of a sudden in August, he noticed that all of his friends from school have left. They've gone off to college. And he was like, ooh, that's weird. Where are all my friends? And so he finally came in and said, and he got majorly depressed with this. And uh, 
but it was kind of that kick and that realization. So, oh, I guess I do have to buy in you know, and participate in this. And uh, and that's really hard. You know, how much do you, you know, what, where do you draw the line of the tough love as a parent, right? I mean, his dad was struggling because his dad's like, well, he needs to be working at this more. You know, but where the, the, the dad is not in a great position of power because what's he going to do? Just cut him off and he is homeless? So it's, it's tough it's at, that, at that age because you, you see this great potential. And I think, I think that's one of the other difficulties in this concept about trajectory um, that I like to really start talking to families at around age 10 to 12 about where, where do you see your child doing as an adult? Where do you see them? an adult and really get um, kind of a framework of um, a reality check with regards to that. And, and I think that, that um, you know, you have so many boys that have autism spectrum disorder and no offense to men in the audience uh, and I guess no offense to women, I'll probably offend both groups. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I have four daughters, and you know, I'm at my eight, daughter's eighth grade award ceremony for graduating from eighth grade. And, uh, you know, the, their, their academic honors, 10 girls and one boy. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, school, academic environment, in my opinion, is tailored towards individuals that are stronger in language, the, lang the language arts. And so many of, of, if you think about autism as the extreme male brain, quoting Simon Baron Cohen, uh, you know, these, you have these individuals, if you take kind of the classic neuropsych profile of, of an individual with autism, you know, these lower verbal skills and higher performance skills. Yet we kind of this bill of goods to, the, to all of our kids about, you have to go to four-year university, you have to do this, you know, you need these jobs that are these you know, high academic jobs. And we have devalued the hands-on jobs, you know, the, the vocations that you might get through vote tech school. And so I really like to, to talk about that with parents and say, what is wrong with that? You know, I a, saw a boy today, we had this discussion, he's 10 years old, had his back to me, he never looked at me, but boy, he built this beautiful Lego house, and I was watching him build it, and watching when he put the pieces, how he would recognize where he had to provide, you know, pressure to properly apply it so it didn't fall apart. I mean, he, it was beautiful to watch him do this. And his dad, who, he's, he's in a perfect family for this. Um, his dad rides motocross bikes, works out in the shop, and totally has his kid out there. And kid's uh, uh, bedroom is like a lab experiment. He's got all these computers for torn apart and all these uh, different things he's working on. You know, and hey, you know, computer uh, repair, you know, not bad. I mean, I think there's a lot of potential roles for this boy that would require a different avenue than a four-year university. You know, so it does require you know, the continued work you know, past the age 18 and the continued support in the, in the, in the typical and average case. How well I know that. Yes, <laughs> yes, you do. Um, just a, another vignette, a boy that uh, developed um, uh, some uh, substance abuse issues between age 18 and 22, got in the wrong group, was just having emerging social interests and so joined the group that attracted, you know, that was putting up with some of his uh, oddities and, and he became, you know, addicted to some street things, went into a treatment center. Parents worked with him, he eventually got went off and he started to have the buy-in and was having more, he'd already been developing the self-awareness but started having the buy-in. Went off to, to develop uh, uh, skills, he went to a book school for, um, for drafting. He had this great ability you know, for drafting on a computer. And he got done with the school, and then, but he didn't like it. You know, it was kind of what his parents saw for him, which was great and valuable. You know? And how many of us do are doing today what we thought we were going to do at age 18? Right, very few. So I think that's really important, you know, to, to do, it's okay to, that's not failure, right? So now he works down in the shipyards. Uh, he's got a job, he's doing apprenticeship, he's 29 now. So he went through this kind of 
different path, and eventually he's got this job, and and uh, you know so so again it's just it's longer though it's drawn out you know for these individuals you have to stay at it longer, um, but then you have to know when to pull back, and that's a beautiful dance. I have a question, um, and I guess it concerns me from the 18 to 21 where they're supported by the school, but I also calling down to OSPI. I find that they are not, there's no degree per se that you can get in a transitional age specifically. In order to become a special education or a transition teacher, you have to go K through 12. And personally, I've been there and done that for 18 years. So, and I'm a teacher by trade. But I'm just saying, um, what do you think the chances are that we could start focusing in more specifically on this group so that our teachers are coming out with a greater um, knowledge base on 18 to 21 and maybe specify how we might want to work with that particular age group. And the second question I have is, unfortunately at 21, we all know, I feel like it's going to be a big cliff, we get supported and then they fall off. And it feels like to me something I wish to see more of is a community network, a community uh, support, like a net of support to help our children all the way around and get greater community awareness around this is something that we need to take seriously if we support our individuals that live within our community. It seems like so many times we have to ship our kids to the other side of town where the supports already are. And part of that also is you're saying, but there's there's you know very sliver here of, of recognition that this is being addressed. So how do we get involved in our educational system to further train our teachers? How do we create that community safety net? And how do we get those funding sources so that they can start to pay attention to the fact that we are those new parents coming into this early childhood education all over again as 18 children. Perfect, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think I've thought about this a lot, and as a medical doctor, I've been kind of frustrated uh, because I really don't have a pull on the, in the, edu in the world of education that I think somebody needs to pull there. Uh, I do think there needs to be a track for special education of older individuals. I think there needs to be a specific track. Um, there, from my understanding, there isn't one uh, anywhere. There's, there's, uh, there are individuals that have an interest because they've got a sibling or they've got, you know, whatever. Um, they get some exposure and they fall in love with this work, which, which, uh, and I think it's, for me, it's been, um, so valuable to work with uh, older individuals and adults, even if I'm going to just go into the young early intervention, because it gives me a perspective. You know, I see so many individuals that go through their education and they only work in early intervention. And I think they, are, they really have difficulty in understanding you know, where is this, this concept of trajectory. So I think there's value, not just for individuals that would go into it as a career, but also the individuals that are working with the, with the younger kids. And uh, I don't know exactly where I mean, I've been trying, I, if I had more time, I think I would uh, be working on this more with regards to trying to convince uh, Eileen Schwartz and the College of Education uh, over at the University of Washington uh, you know, to develop a track for this. I think, uh, I think ultimately it's going to require uh, you know, uh, somebody with a big checkbook uh, that says, I'm going to get, write you this check if you designate an endowed chair specifically for this. Mm -hmm. And then then they'll show interest. And then, uh, you know, I hate to say it that way, but that's how I think it's going to need that to work. Uh, and then I think we'll see, we will see it. I think it will come. I think the other thing that's going to come that's just going to take time is I think our kids are going to do a better job than we have done uh, to welcome these individuals into society. Because I think these kids are in classes with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wasn't. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I agree. Um, now, you know, and, and is, this, uh, is this a true epidemic? Was it around when I was in elementary school? Uh, if you look at a study that came out of the UK from two years ago, where they did a very extensive door-to-door -door survey of a, of a community of adults. And they went and did diagnostic evals after screening. They came up with 1% of their adults with autism spectrum disorder. This is one in 100. 
So that data would suggest that it's not an epidemic, that it's not an increase in the incidence, it's our awareness and the diagnostic criteria and all the other factors that influence prevalence numbers. I, don't, I think those, you know, so the idea now, there could be some degree, certainly environmental factors may be playing a role. The fact is I didn't see those kids, you know, they're strangers to me. You know, the only reason that I got to know any of them is because of the work I did. So how do I expect my friend who's in the, who owns a business to welcome these guys into, uh, you know, into employment or, or to allow them to, uh, you know, run around and scream in the, uh, you know, waiting in line at the football game. I don't know. Or go to the club. Maybe they'd be good dancers. So I, I think our kids, you know, I see my kids as who are so so-called neurotypical doing a better job than, than we've done. So I, you don't want to wait that long, though, do you? Well, you we're know, here. You want right? to do we're, it now. We're the new wave again. Yeah. In other words, we're the early childhood that started early childhood because we started recognizing it more. And now our kids are 18 plus in that mid-20s. And like you say, we're having to push it all again. Here it comes all new. Yeah. And it comes back to you just like when they were three and five and child buying and all that. And it just seems like... I just wish I knew what to do instead of spinning my wheels as far as how we as a community can kind of, I don't know, I just, that's... You gotta do it again. Yeah. You know, I, I'm but sorry. But smarter. You know, I'd like to do a, it smarter. It's just, you know, yeah. it's just gotta be done again, it's just with this age. Okay, everybody can go home now. <laughs> Great audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.